Hi everyone, today we are going to look at The Giver and Gathering Blue, two books for our young adult literature unit. And as with the other books, we're going to be talking about some of the features of these novels as well as how they meet the developmental needs of readers. We'll also be looking at a little bit of um, dystopian and utopian fiction and talking about what that is about. Now, if you are a subscriber to my channel, um, some of this can be found in one of my lectures for my um, science fiction and literature class. And if you've taken that course, this is kind of a recap of what I talk about for that class as well. So um, a utopia, if you're not familiar with that term, a utopia is an imagined world where everything is perfect. So because of social, economic, and scientific changes, things like pain, war, and disease have been eliminated. Um, this is a term that comes from a book um, by Thomas More uh, called Utopia, where he kind of imagined what the perfect place would be like. A dystopia <clears throat> changes that beginning part of the word. So our Greek, there we go. Utopia actually means no place, but the word dis um, being added on here meaning bad or evil. And a dystopia is a world in which people were working toward perfection, but something went wrong. So typically a government tried to set up a perfect society. And in this particular work, in this book or novel, we're seeing how things are the opposite. <laughs> um, there's too much government control in some instances, or there's just complete chaos. So something's gone wrong and the society is quite sick. This is suffering from, the society suffers from pain and injustice in some way. So newer dystopian fiction is often from a young adult's perspective. I think there's a couple reasons for this. First, you have a whole generation of authors who grew up reading books like Brave New World, Fahrenheit 451, 1984, and now they want to kind of put their own spin on it. The other reason is that I talked about this in my last lecture on teenage development, um, Dystopian worlds really appeal to young adults. So in typical dystopian works um, currently, um, the current trend of the past couple years, there's over control. Um, a teenage character is going through those changes and starting to rebel and trying to find their identity. And that's and the over control of the society is kind of an extended metaphor for um, a teenager's life as they try to struggle and find their own identity. And then the teenager will typically in the book rebel, <laughs> um, trying to find a sense of justice. Um, they'll rebel against the society. There's man versus society or person versus society conflict. And the teenager usually triumphs in the end. So some dystopian traits. There's an inciting incident, some type of catastrophe that nearly destroyed the world. The, the, I don't think I have this phrase, but there is a Latin phrase. Um, bear with me. I don't even have a mouse. This is on my, my pad um, here on my computer. So it's called in medias race. That means in the middle of things. So typically, one more. R E S. Okay, done, sort of. Um, looks like a third grader wrote it, but that's okay. In media's race means we pick up in the middle of things. Most books that are dystopian in nature, we don't see that inciting incident. We don't see the catastrophe that destroyed the world. Sometimes we don't even really know exactly what happened. Um, but there are hints about it. Memories may have been, um, the memory and the history has somewhat been erased, but we know that something happened. In response to that disaster, there was a desire to create order from the chaos. Now, this is a little bit different in Gathering Blue, but we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, erasure and revision of history and memory. So memory is quite important in dystopian works. 
perhaps we are erasing a past where people didn't rely on science and that's what the government wants you to rely on. So now we don't have any art or culture. Um, or <clears throat> perhaps it's the opposite. Um, in Ayn Rand's anthem, we have a, a society where there is really no science and they're kind of living in a primitive way. Um, <clears throat> excessive measures of police and military to try to control the co the chaos and then loss of freedom again to try to control the chaos so freedom of press speech religion these things do not typically exist media manipulation and propaganda um, flawed or abused technological advances as well as medical advances um this is a quote from Cicero, but I think it applies here. To be ignorant of what occurred before you were born is to remain perpetually a child. For what is the worth of a human life unless it is woven into the life of our ancestors by the records of history? Um, this is key to both of these books. The idea that we have a teenage protagonist who is in some way trying to preserve or find memories and history of the past um, while other people are so ignorant of it that they really are like children. So dystopian traits in the individual. A lot of times in these books there will be a division or categorization of people, um, especially in a, in a society that has too much control. So the division of people by labor, by um, the types of job that they have, and that that would be dictated by the government. So there's no real choice here. Um, we're going to see this in The Giver as people are assigned their jobs by the government. Collectivization of goods and lands. Um, so extreme... Uh, form of communism here, um, collectivization. I talk more about this in one of my other lectures, again, for that sci-fi class. But collectivization basically means that the government takes all of the goods um, that people produce, all of the land, and they distribute it as they see fit, as happened in communist Russia and other communist countries. The loss or limit of personal freedom. So just as we have the loss of freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom to assemble, freedom of religion, we also have other things that are under governmental control. How people are educated, um, where they live, who their spouse is going to be, what career they will have, um, how they are able or not to express themselves. Limited emotional range. So many times... Um, Again, reflecting the needs of a teenage reader, a teenager is going through a lot of complex emotions and they're moving from a place from childhood into adulthood. Part of that is emotional development and having, <clears throat> um, you know, a little kid will just say, I'm angry. A teenager will be able to point out, um, I'm slightly annoyed or I feel anxious instead of just, I'm worried, I'm afraid, um, like a younger kid will. They might know that they are anticipating, let's say, going to college and they feel happy and anxious and um, and worried and joyful that they're leaving home for the first time, um, looking forward to meeting new people, being worried about whether or not they can pass their classes, right? There's a lot going on all in one, uh, all in one go. So in dystopian literature, a lot of the people, because they've had everything controlled, they also have a limited emotional range. And this is going to be important in both the books, but it comes out in really two totally different ways. And then eventually an erasure of identity. So you can kind of see, again, things that are important to teenagers, where I'm going to go to school, who I'm going to marry eventually or date, um, what career I'm going to go into, where I'm going to live, how I express myself, um, how I feel things, what I feel about things, what I think about things, and who I am as a person. All of these are erased in dystopian literature. Um, so I think that naturally <laughs> a teenager struggling with some of these things would be interested to see and read about someone who pushes through the system to be able to have the freedom to make these decisions and to 
gain their own identity. So often um, in young adult literature, some dystopian traits we see family units. Um, if family units exist, sometimes they do not. If they do, they're going to be highly structured. So we're looking at the giver, which has um, a husband, a wife, and one to two children. That's what families are allowed. Three children are not. No children are. Um, but certainly the, the goal is for everybody to have two. Um, in other instances, like with Gathering Blue, we see families that are kind of not structured and there's no real love or bond between them. If you read a book like Brave New World, um, which is an adult book but sometimes taught to teenagers, um, that book has no family units. So children are brought up by the state. Emotions are manipulated or suppressed. The teenage protagonist feels alone and different and isolated. They want to be a unique individual. They realize that something is wrong with this system. And as they come of age, they realize their emotions are outside the norm and they long for something else. Sometimes they express this through creative arts. So writing a diary um, in the book Matched, she writes poetry um, and then eventually, I think music as well. Um, in other books, you have someone who's an artist in some way. Kira um, in Gathering Blue is able to do embroidery and sewing. And they begin to fight against the system that they once enjoyed the benefits of. Um, <clears throat> I did not put here, uh, I think I might have it later, but one of the key things to dystopian literature is a triangle, a love triangle. And I, um, thinking about it, I do have that later, so we'll discuss that then. I didn't put this in here, but that's another thing. <sighs> It's a trope that kind of annoys me, but I understand why it's done and how it's useful, kind of reflecting what kids are going through. So an overview of both books. Um, Lois Lowry is the author of both. She's known for writing about difficult subject matter in middle grade and young adult novels. So I think I mentioned one of her books before Number of the Stars. She's explored complex issues such as racism, terminal illness, murder, the Holocaust, and questioning authority. Um, her writing has brought her both praise and criticism. So with The Giver, some schools have adopted this as part of mandatory curriculum. So it's in every ninth grade English class. Others have challenged the book and again, not banning it, um, but challenging it. So trying to prohibit it from being included in classroom studies. And I think that The Giver gives more, gets more attention because it's a little bit of an older book. It came out um, with a lot of media attention, a lot of fanfare. Gathering Blue, to me in some ways, um, it's almost more interesting it's not quite as tightly written as The Giver, but there is a lot there of value, and I, I kind of wish that it got more attention. But that's one of the reasons that I recommended that you guys read both, because they are really good companion pieces to each other. So The Giver follows Jonas through the 12th and 13 years of his life. Um, he is 12, but typically this book is not given to middle schoolers. Sometimes it is, and especially for kids who are advanced and who really love reading and like to read up. But a lot of times it'll be taught in um, ninth grade curriculum, sometimes 10th. So <clears throat> the society has eliminated pain and strife by converting to sameness. This is a plan to eradicate um, problems from society. So I can't be jealous of you if we have the same house. And you can't be jealous of me if we're being paid the same salary. Um, <clears throat> but the sameness even extends to things like the weather, which kind of makes you ask about, you know, how things are being controlled. The plan, though, also eradicates emotional depth. So Really, people are kind of living on the surface of life. Jonas is selected to inherit the position of receiver of memory. So that is the job that he is assigned to. There's a lot there with ceremony and rituals of the society that kind of replace religion and how they show different stages of children um, growing up, maturing and becoming adults. So there's a lot of really interesting world building there. 
But the receiver of the memory is the person who stores all of the memories of the past, of the time before sameness. So there's a little bit of um, almost magic here or possibly some some science fiction. Something is going on where the (coughs) the giver holds all of the town's memories. He passes those on to the receiver. Um, The receiver stores them so that if the others ever need help with making decisions, they can come to him and he can say, oh, this happened in the past and therefore we should take such and such an action. That's sort of the general idea. Gathering Blue features Kira, a teenage girl of 15. She has a deformed leg and was recently orphaned. So she is working with a disability and in this book, the physical impairment or the physical difference um, is quite a large piece of how she is treated and what her life looks like because the village she lives in is primitive. So the council of the village has to decide whether they're going to send her out to the beasts of the field to kind of be torn apart and killed, or if they're going to allow her to live. They decide she's gifted with embroidery. Um, They have a singer who sings the history of the town, a walking stick that's carved that the singer uses to note his place as he sings the song, and the robe that he wears that also tells the history. So the title Gathering Blue refers to the dye that Kira has to learn to make before the council changes their minds. What we have in these two books are dystopian societies where we're picking up in the middle of things in Medius Race. We are picking up after Long, long in the past, some sort of disaster has happened that's fragmented each of these societies. Um, In the case of the giver, they relied on um, scientific advancement um, and fascist principles to make sure that everyone was the same and that everyone is relatively happy. In Gathering Blue, what we see is sort of almost the opposite of this, where the society maybe never came back from that chaos. And they've got kind of a town council. They've got kind of a way to remember what happened. But for the most part, things are still quite chaotic and they're living uh, almost in anarchy. So is this a series? Um, uh, I really struggle with this. The, the, first, let's talk about the protagonist age. Uh, the giver, as I said, Jonas is 12, but the subject matter is a little bit heavier. So often it's taught to kids in high school, teens in high school. In Gathering Blue, um, Kira is about 15. So she's around the age of the typical younger high school reader. So someone in maybe around 10th grade. Um, The Giver was published in 1993. Gathering Blue was published seven years later in 2000. These were followed by two other books, uh, Messenger and Son. But initially they were written as standalone novels and only later did she decide to connect the books into the series. So here's what she said. Gathering Blue is a separate book. I wanted to explore what a society might become after a catastrophic world event. Only at the end did I realize I could make it connect to the giver. So there are some hints, sort of, at the very end of the book um, that connect the two novels. My problem with this, oh, there we go. Messenger is in 2004 and Sun is in 2012. Those two books are okay, (laughs) Um, but... I think that The Giver is very tightly written, and by that I mean that every word counts. There is a lot of symbolism and a lot of world building for such a short book. (coughs) And Gathering Blue, um, not as tightly written, but again, interesting world building. And really some interesting characterization as well in both books. Messenger and Son, personally, I did not enjoy them as much. But I know other people who like all four books. Um, My difficulty is because of the, the ending of The Giver, both books are 
kind of have an open ending, meaning that it really is up to you to decide what happens. And to me, that's really important for teenage readers to have because by that age, not everything is black and white and there are no easy answers. So putting them together in a series, I I don't... (laughs) From that standpoint, I kind of don't like, I don't like that that happened, Um, but it is what it is. It's kind of like I also don't like the fact that J.K. Rowling wrote The Cursed Child after completing the series Harry Potter because it's not necessary um, and it changes the story in some fundamental ways that... um, that go against the original intent of the story. But it's, you know, I mean, that's her prerogative as the author. It's just that I don't agree with it. But we'll talk about the endings of the book in our discussion forums, and I'd really like to see what you guys have to say. Cognitive development is some great fan art of Kira. I love it. Um, <clears throat> by their teenage years, teens begin to think about how their life fits into the larger world around them. I talked about that in my last lecture. Both of these books focus on a protagonist attempting to become a more responsible adult in order to help the society in which they live. So it's interesting. Um, Cognitively, I talked a lot about how teens go through a rebellious period. And both of these characters are sort of rebelling against the system, but they're also sort of trying to help it as well. And we'll talk in our um, discussions in class uh, online about whether or not you think that they're hurting the society or helping the society by some of their final actions. Um, Both young adults, Kira and Jonas, make great strides to mature. So they really, truly are moving from being a teenager to being an adult, even though, again, technically, you know, in the book, Jonas is 12. Um, In the movie, I think they made him 17. And to me... That fits better in some ways, Um, but we used to have a different understanding of childhood and when people mature. Having said that, I think that you can see Jonas moving from being a teenager to being an adult, even though he's technically only 13. And I would not say he moves from being a child to being a teenager um, because of some of the things that happen to him, some of the things he finds out about the world in which he lives and and the decisions that he is forced to make. Abstract thinking is another milestone reached. Um, Both books, a lot of world building. That means that there's a focus on the setting and the rules of the society, um, the social setting, as well as the physical setting. So yeah, there are some things there physically to notice, but socially, um, what rules are set up and where can you see um, a lot, a lot of symbolism in both books. Um, They tackle difficult subject material, so social struggles, internal emotional toil, death. Um, Both books are quite frank about death. Again, not in really graphic ways where we can see, you know, the blood and the guts and the gore, but you do, well, I guess you do see um, a little bit of it in both books. And it's It's from the character's perspective. So the character is seeing what's happening. This is not like um, some of the books for upper middle grade where a death would occur, but it didn't really happen in the sight of the protagonist. In addition, both protagonists must use their reasoning skills. So there is kind of a mystery here in both books and they have to solve the mystery and then decide how to serve their community or how to leave their community behind. Um, Navigating society's rules. Neither book, there are friends in these books, but we don't see as complex, I guess, friendships um, as we do in other books. We'll talk about that in a moment. So emotional development. Yes, there's there's the movie depiction of Jonas, clearly not 12 years old um, with Gabe, another character in the story. So neither Kira nor Jonas is romantically involved with anyone. And to me, that's quite refreshing. Now, I want to say I think that we don't see a romantic involvement in part because these books were written a while ago. If we um and wow at the time you're watching this or listening um we're almost at the 20 year mark um for Kira's story so they don't feature a love story currently 
over the past five, ten years, young adult dystopian works often and almost always have a love triangle. There is a partner who represents society. There is a partner who represents rebellion. The central protagonist, usually a girl, has to choose between the guy that she grew up with who was her best friend, but he represents the old her and her childhood and also what society wants. And then the new guy who's kind of a bad boy and he represents the, something new and different and exciting and, and her future life. And it's just, uh, it's just tough hiring to me. You know, I think that a lot of people copied the Hunger Games with this. The Hunger Games kind of takes that and twists it a tiny bit. Um, the person who represents the rebellion is the person that she knew better in her childhood. And the person who represents what society wants is really who she's drawn to. So it's kind of interesting, but um, really boring. Um, <laughs> really boring <laughs> to me anyway. But uh, again, to young adults, maybe not so much, especially if they're reading something for the first time. A book like Matched or The Selection or um, something to that to that extent where we have that kind of a love triangle. Maybe uh, a teenage girl would like that. Um, there are some hints at romantic feelings um, here and there, but Lowry didn't include any romantic entanglements. So really what we are looking at is a solitary journey of a protagonist, a lot of internal conflict about what to do, and it is a journey that they are taking on their own to become an adult, um, just like many of our journeys in life. So peer relationships, not as important. Some of the things in The Giver, they talk about the stirrings, which are um, when you start to have romantic or sexual feelings. Um, in Gathering Blue, um, a younger boy, Matt, who's Kira's friend, he... Sorry, my mic there. He talks to her about how she could maybe be married or how she probably won't be married someday, but he hopes that she can be. So kind of showing um, that they're about the right age for those things to take place, but really left out of the story. However, they have intense emotional challenges to overcome. Confusion about identity, um, considering the future when making decisions, faced with large decisions that are going to affect their lives later on. Both novels have a teenager facing a life change. So in The Giver, Jonas stresses about being assigned to a career. We see the first part of the book is his childhood, and then he's assigned this career of being the receiver of memory. In Gathering Blue, the book opens with the death of Kira's mother. So um, I talked about that in my previous lecture, getting rid of all the parents. <laughs> um, Jonas has parents, kind of, but um, really he's relying on the giver to be his mentor. Uh, Kira, on her own, has to find a mentor on her own to kind of help her through some of these changes. But again, a lot of the times they're on their own. They're both about to become independent, and the consequences of failing are horrifying. It could mean death um, or worse. So symbolically, the changes that they're going through really represent this heightened version of a typical adolescent's journey toward adulthood. This is a wonderful depiction. Um, Joseph Campbell is a scholar, or was a scholar rather, who came up with the idea of the monomyth. Basically, he looked at a lot of things in mythology and a lot of um, books and stories about adventure. And he said that many myths follow this general pattern. So we have a character who's in the everyday world. They are called to adventure. So sometimes they refuse the call. Sometimes they gain, they have supernatural aid to help them. Um, a lot of times they will have a mentor. They pass through the first threshold, meaning that they resist and then they eventually they commit to going on this adventure or undertaking these challenges. They face challenges and temptations. Um, in some way, they have an ordeal. 
that brings them to a place of rebirth. And then they are challenged to return. So they return and they're either kind of having the freedom to live in this ordinary world again, or they're the master of two worlds. Um, this, this isn't like a hard and set rule for every young adult fantasy or science fiction novel, but it is a pattern that a lot of people follow. And it's also known as the hero's journey. So um, I want you to kind of look for this pattern in both of these books if you if you end up reading both of them. What is their everyday world like? How are they called to something different? Um, how do they resist that calling? What trials do they go through? Um, the They have an ordeal that brings rebirth or do they have a final death and kind of rebirth in that sense? And then when the challenges are over what happens then we don't exactly have quite this for either of these books and a lot of times you don't and there should be kind of another arrow kind of like something else over here um but we do have i think at least the call to adventure the road of trials and some type of transformation so look for some of those steps as we go through our pattern here. Sorry, look for the steps in that pattern as we go through the book, especially emotionally. Social development, <laughs> some other fan art of the people in the, uh, in Kira's book, um, Gathering Blue. Teenagers might feel misunderstood. They struggle against their parents or authority figures as they try to discover who they are outside their family. The typical journey of a teenager is symbolically represented here. So moving from conformity to identity. Unlike regular teenagers who move from conformity of their parents to conformity of a peer group oftentimes um, before, by the time they're 18, 19, 20, they're kind of able to, at that point sometimes, um, break free of that and form really a true identity all their own. Um, <clears throat> but at any rate, watch for world, world building, as I mentioned before, person versus society conflict. That's kind of the core of these stories. Each teen has a friend or mentor to guide them, but for the most part, their parents are absent, uh, as in the case of Kira, her mother has died. Um, or with Jonas, they're kind of, they're there, but they're not fully able to participate in his life. And as he moves from being a child to being an adult, you can really see how the beginning of the book, they're more present. Um, the middle of the book, he feels separated from them. And by the end of the book, they're really not part of his journey. While socializing and friendships are important to readers in high school, it's not reflected um, in these novels. So in some ways, I picked for you books that are not featuring typical teenagers, though we will see that a little bit in Persepolis. So that's not something that you, well, there's a little bit of stuff about Jonas's school and his friends and how he starts to move away from them as well. We do have Kira having a friend um, in Matt. If you look here, little Matt, Matt and Branch, the dog. Um, but they are isolated and set apart because of their adult responsibilities. So the pressure of being an adult in a world for children and for emotionally stunted people, when they have emotional depth, that's something that they're going to struggle with. Um, similar to Paul and Tangerine, you know, how do you connect socially with people who are shallow? The other thing I'd like you to look for is how younger children in both books are used to emphasize the social and emotional development of the older teen protagonist. So Matt and Branch in, um, well, Branch is a dog, but Matt in Gathering Blue um, and the little singer, Joe, we see here, um, also in Gathering Blue, um, how do they compare and contrast to Kira? And for Jonas, he has a younger sister, Lily, and we will see how her emotions reflect the child that he used to be. So 
kind of like the middle grade books we looked at. But here, instead of having an older child and a younger child, we just have some younger ones. Um, so watch for those watch for those contrasts. Controversy. Top five reasons the giver has been challenged. Unsuitable to age group. Violence. Um, sexually explicit is only 10%. Religious viewpoint is 10%. Suicide is 7%. So you can see the top reason here as, compo- as opposed to all books. Most books are challenged because of their sexual explicitness. Um, this one is just unsuited to age group. My guess is that a lot of times this book is challenged because it is put in a classroom with fifth or sixth graders because of the length of the book. And probably the people teaching those classes, if they haven't read it before, um, they probably didn't fully realize what material was going to be in the book. Um, So despite the accolades the giver has received, it met with a lot of opposition and it was put on the American Library Association, the ALA. It's one of the most frequently challenged and banned books. Um, The subject matter, the the author's treatment of death, there is... There are some instances here of euthanasia. They talk about um, other things. I don't want to give too much away, (laughs) but you'll kind of discover it as you go. And then we can talk about it in our class. So when asked for her opinion on the book banning or why the book was challenged, here's what she had to say. I think banning books is a very, very dangerous thing. It takes away an important freedom. Anytime there is an attempt to ban a book, you should fight it as hard as you can. It's okay for a parent to say, I don't want my child to read this book. But it's not okay for anyone to try to make that decision for other people. The world portrayed in The Giver is a world where choice has been taken away. It's a frightening world. Let's keep, let's work hard to keep it from truly happening. Um, I, I put that whole quote there because I think it's quite insightful. And she's getting to the core of the issue. Um, The problem is (laughs) it's okay for a parent to say, I don't want my children to read this book, but it's not okay for anyone to make that decision for other people. So what happens, though, is that sometimes a book like this will be in curriculum in school and then parents don't feel like they have a say and that's why they challenge the book. So their kid will come home with it and maybe their kids in fifth or sixth grade. Um, I do know of someone who picked up this book in fourth grade, but just sort of saw it on the library shelf, liked um, another series by Lowry that that is less uh, troublesome and uh <laughs> there <laughs> was a little bit shocked at what they found in the book. But um, that's what happens when you have precocious readers who people who like to really read up and read ahead. Um, so again, yeah, this is why it's it's taught for for older kids much of the time and why it really now is considered a young adult book. So here is an excerpt from the giver. The man shook his head. No, no, he said. I'm not being clear. It's not my past, my childhood that I must transmit to you. He leaned back, resting his head against the back of the upholstered chair. It's the memories of the whole world, he said with a sigh. Before you, before me, before the precious, the previous receiver, and generations before him. Jonas frowned. The, the whole world, he asked. I don't understand. Do you mean not just us? Not just the community? Do you mean elsewhere, too? He tried in his mind to grasp the concept. I'm sorry, sir. I don't understand exactly. Maybe I'm not smart enough. I don't know what you mean when you say the whole world or generations before him. I thought there was only us. I thought there was only now. Oh... You guys, there's so much here in just this little passage. And this is what I mean about the whole book. It like it it reveals things in these really elegant ways. Um, So what do we have here? We have the giver 
talking about how he's going to transmit memories to Jonas. We have Jonas learning that there's more than just his community for the first time in his life, and he's 12 years old. So if you think um, about a a person who's been really sheltered or or part of a... um, I'm trying to think like part of a cult. A lot of times people who are, um, let me think of a good example. uh, Okay, so people who are in the Amish community, for example, they know what's in the outside world, right? They go through a rumspringa running around period when they're teenagers to kind of let them experience the world. And then they decide if they want to become Amish or not. Um, But Imagine if you were living like an Amish person um, with no zippers and only buttons and you were riding in horse-drawn carriages. Um, And I forget the name of the movie that was kind of like this. Um, But imagine if you're living like that and you don't know that there's New York City um, a couple hours away from you. Or you don't know that you live in a larger country with states like Florida and California, let alone a larger world with places like Europe. Um, I have watched documentaries with cult members, former cult members, who said that they were told repeatedly that Europe had been destroyed, that there was no more Europe. Um, that pieces of Africa had fallen into the water, like bizarre things like that. So that's kind of almost what's going on here. And again, part of his cognitive shift from being a child to being an adult, that he realizes that there's a larger community. Um, The capitalization of elsewhere, like they sort of talk about this in a vague kind of way. But when they say elsewhere, they mean other communities just like theirs. And then they might be like, and there's elsewhere, but that's a big scary place and we don't know anything about it. Um, His mind trying to grasp the concept and he's apologizing because he's trying to be polite here. Um, Maybe I'm not smart enough rather than telling the old man he doesn't know what he's talking about. And uh, uh, this idea here that there's only now. So just like a teenager begins to think about the future and moves from this childhood understanding of the world where they they just look at the immediate, you know, um, there's this marshmallow test where if you give a child a marshmallow and tell them not to eat it, and if they don't, they'll get two marshmallows. Most kids will eat that marshmallow (laughs) because they don't really understand, young kids, a lot of them will, um, they don't really understand concepts of time. And we talked about how 11 to 13 year olds have that kind of YOLO uh, mentality. You only live once, right? They don't think about consequences. But older teenagers do. And they also think about the larger world around them. What's my place in the community? What's my place in the larger world? So there's a lot going on here. And it's kind of jam packed. Um, Really, really pay attention. It's you know, I don't say this about many books, but this book is almost like a poem where every word counts, almost like a short story. It really is brilliantly written. Gathering Blue, this is a picture from the stage play um, that a, a, a high school put on. Here's the excerpt. So shifting over from Jonas to Kira. Um, Kira is out in the field with her mother, and this is how the book opens. There was no reply. She hadn't expected one. Her mother had been dead now four days, and Kira could tell that the last of the spirit was drifting away. Kira wiped briefly at her eyes, which had filled with tears. She loved her mother and would miss her terribly, but it was time for her to go. She wedged her walking stick in the soft ground, leaned on it, and pulled herself up. She looked around uncertainly. She was young still and had not experienced death before, not in the small two-person family that she and her mother had been. Of course, she had seen others go through the rituals. She could see some of them in the vast, foul-smelling field of leaving, huddled beside the ones whose lingering spirits they tended. She knew that a woman named Helena was there, watching over the spirit of leave her infant, who had been born too soon. Helena had come to the field only the day before. Infants did not require the four days of watching. The wisp of their spirits barely arrived, drifted away quickly. 
So Helena would return to the village and her family soon. As for Kira, she had no family now, nor any home. The cot she had shared with her mother had been burned. This was always done after sickness. The small structure, the only home Kira had known, was gone. She had seen the smoke in the distance as she sat with the body. As she watched the spirit of her mother drift away, she had seen the cindered fragments of her childhood life whirl into the sky as well. Oh, it's so beautiful. So in terms of uh, being concise and having that really tight language of the giver, we don't see that as much here. But what we do see is this really beautiful prose with these lovely descriptions. Um, again, something that I didn't talk about this, but a lot more young adult literature will have long descriptions of things. Um, or longer, <laughs> rather. When we get into adult literature, you see a lot longer descriptions and a lot less uh, action. But at any rate, the world building here, there's just so much um, about this setting and about these people. Just in these four paragraphs, we have this understanding that they... Um, they watch the dead depending on how old they are and how much spirit they have. So a little baby um, would only have a tiny wisp of a spirit and um, Helena can will just be there maybe a day for her infant. Um, whereas Kira's mother, who was an adult, she has more spirit left in her or before she died. And so therefore Kira is there for four days. Another thing that you might not be able to tell here, um, because it is short, is that they have a thing in their society with names. So when a child is first born and up until their teenage years, they have a one syllable name. So Kira started as Kier. Um, then as a teenager, she moved into a two syllable name, Kira. Helena, three syllables, um, the woman there who has just had the infant, um, that would be someone who would be considered an adult. And then later we meet Anna Bella, four syllables, um, which is unusual, Kira says, because a lot of people don't live long enough to have a four syllable name. We also see this word cot, C-O-T-T. Um, there they're talking about a house, the, the house that she lived in with her mother. You kind of get the idea that these are like little shanties or huts that are put up almost in sort of a primitive style. And I want you guys to watch for that, how they talk about, you know, the the village itself, how it's set up. Um, I have a picture in my head and I, I kind of like to see if it matches what other people think. And then um, the last bit here about burning the structure because there had been sickness, that's what happens. They always have to burn that, right? Well, that again, going back hundreds of years ago where they didn't have proper medicine and they didn't understand quarantining exactly, but they knew that the, the way to kill the germs would be to burn things. So when there was plague, um, the the story, the Velveteen Rabbit kind of reflects that. This kid goes through an illness and then uh, the possessions, including this stuffed animal, are burned. Um, sorry to spoil Velveteen Rabbit for you if you haven't read the book. But um, yeah, so you, you really get a good sense of the, the rituals of the society, the beliefs of the society, how they are living and the fact that they're living without um, without modern medicine, without modern technology, all of that kind of thing. And, and a little bit more of that, more details unfold as the book goes on. So that's something I'd like you to look for, the, the differences in these worlds as well as the similarities. So things to consider in both novels. The world building, as I mentioned, Person versus society conflict, a little bit of inner turmoil, but these are dystopian works. So how is the person struggling within and possibly against or struggling for um, the society in which they live? Both books are told in a limited third person point of view. So I think all of the books for our last unit were in first person. Here, the third person is interesting. We get a little bit more of society and I think we see there are some implications for the reader 
Um, and I should have put this word in, but really looking for irony. What might the reader know that the character does not? So there's a, a little bit here because of the point of view um, being limited. There we go. <laughs> and not being in first person, the reader can pick up on some of the hints, some of the mystery about what's been going on in this society. And the two main characters, the protagonists, we kind of see and watch as they come to these realizations without really having them tell themselves um, what they're thinking and feeling, which is kind of interesting. So some of the symbols in The Giver, I mentioned this book is packed with symbolism. Um, some of the more prominent ones, color color I don't want to talk about too much um, because it's kind of a plot point as well but watch for colors um, particularly red and blue and what those might mean. Christmas is a word that is not actually used but there is a depiction of a scene that is sort of supposed to be Christmas um, and there are some hints at that. The sled, the boat, um, war, those are some memories that Jonas is given. Think about what they represent. Language is important. Um, they talk a lot about Jonas's friend Asher and how he couldn't get language correct when he was younger. They had someone who was the enforcer of proper language development. So think about why that's so important to their society. Animals, um, where animals are seen, where they're mentioned, the stirrings, um, <laughs> which are, um, it's interesting how those come about. Medicine, dream telling. Medicine is taken by most of the adults in the society. So think about what that represents and why they're taking it. Dream telling is a ritual that families go through during breakfast. And then there are other ceremonies as well. So again, think about how these ceremonies and these rituals um, play a role in this society and how they mark time rather than um, actual history. And they're kind of there to replace like real um real ritual and ceremony. Symbolism in Gathering Blue. The field, um, Kara is in one of the fields. There's another field that is referred to as well. The beasts that are talked about. There's a lot of talk of this pen for tykes. Tykes are the younger children of the village and their parents want kind of a, a I want to say a playpen, but that's not exactly what it is. So how does that represent the chaos of their society and also the relationships between parent and child? Um, the robe that the singer wears, the singer um, himself or herself in the case of the little singer, the carved stick, the woods, the council, also the names as I just talked about. And then Kira has a piece of cloth um, that she holds. There's a lot there with art and um, what it takes to be a good artist and how their art is kind of being used by the by their society. Um, much like people um, during communist Russia who were recruited for the Olympics. So Russia would have, um, the USSR rather, would have uh, places for athletes to train. And sometimes children were taken away from their parents to train there. Um, so something similar sort of is going on with Gathering Blue. Internal conflicts as well as the person versus society conflicts, emotional turmoil, and again, that symbolic journey from childhood to young adulthood. Also, themes of memory and history. Who controls the memories? Who controls the history? Um, how are those things being passed down? So those, um, I really hope that you have a chance to read Gathering Blue as well as The Giver. Um, I put it on as recommended and you can do it for extra credit, but I really really recommend that you read both of them. I think that they're fascinating to compare and contrast, and I look forward to reading what you guys have to say about them in our discussions and in your papers. That is it, and next time, our last book for our class, which is Persepolis. We're going to talk about young adult literature and move forward into new adult literature as well. That's it. Don't forget to subscribe and share your thoughts below. Thanks! <music>